Hello, and welcome to the 50th Anniversary Bioethics Symposium. My name is Karen Storr. I'm a faculty member in the philosophy department, and I am also a senior research scholar in the Kennedy Institute of Ethics. And today I'll be talking to you about virtue ethics and the skill of good judgment. So I'd like to begin by asking you to think about a question. And here's the question. When you need advice, who do you ask? So this could be personal advice or professional advice. Just imagine in your head the person to whom you go for advice. And now think for a minute about why you choose that person for advice. It's probably because you think that they have good judgment in some way, shape, or form. They might be very knowledgeable about the area, but probably it's more than that. It's also that you think they have some wisdom or some character traits that make them a particularly useful person from, from whom to get advice. I mention this because very often the connection that we see between someone's judgment and their character, we talk about in terms of virtues. And in fact, this is very much how Aristotle himself thought about good judgment in virtue. In fact, for Aristotle, being virtuous is more or less a matter of having good judgment. And so on this video, we're going to be talking about how Aristotle thought about virtue and its relationship to good judgment. But before we do that, I just want to say that although this video is going to focus on Aristotle and his particular version of virtue ethics, there are many versions of virtue ethics out there. One of the most famous and influential versions of it was put forward by Kongza, better known as Confucius. So Confucius's system of ethics can also be understood as a version of virtue ethics. It has some similarities to Aristotle's system um, and also some important differences. Jumping ahead um, a few a uh, thousand years, David Hume, the Scottish philosopher, 18th century Scottish philosopher, also had a moral theory that could be described as a version of virtue ethics. These three theories are quite different from each other. And so it's worth pointing out that virtue ethics isn't a single thing. Aristotle's version of virtue ethics is particularly influential in Western philosophy, and it's also been very influential in bioethics. So today we'll be focusing primarily on that. But just so you know, there's other ways of thinking about virtue and virtue ethics. Okay, but on to Aristotle. What I'm gonna do is start by giving you a sort of big picture look at Aristotle's ethical theory. And then we will narrow in on his conception of virtue and its relationship to good judgment. So Aristotle's most famous ethical work is known as the Nicomachean Ethics. And this is a series of um, books that are sort of put together, but they revolve around a, cert, a, a sort of a question or a concept that Aristotle thinks is really, really important. And that is the concept of flourishing. Aristotle begins the Nicomachean Ethics by posing a question about what flourishing is. What is a good life for a human being? And Aristotle actually thinks this is the single most important question that we can ask. Now, the Greek word that gets translated as flourishing here is eudaimonia. It's also often translated as happiness. Um, these for Aristotle amount to the same thing, but thinking about happiness as mostly a subjective state or a feeling is not really what he had in mind. For Aristotle, flourishing is more about what is a good life for us given what we're like. For Aristotle, our conception of flourishing is tied to our human nature, to what kind of thing that we are. So let me illustrate this first by talking about plants. So you probably have an idea of when a plant is doing well or badly. If your house plants are sort of brown and shriveled like mine are, you might think, hmm, they're not doing so well. They're not flourishing or thriving. And then you might ask yourself what they might need to flourish or thrive better. It could be better lighting, more water, less water, um, feeding, something. But we have an idea of what is good for a plant, what a good um, plant looks like. And we also recognize that what's good or bad for a plant is tied to the kind of thing that it is, the kind of plant that it is. And we make the same assessments when we're talking about non-human animals like dogs. So if we're asking, what is a good life for a dog, maybe more specifically a golden retriever, we'll ask ourselves, well, what are dogs like? What is their nature? And so we think, well, they're social creatures. Um, if it's a retriever, it probably likes tennis balls, lots of food, lots of people. And we can use that conception of a dog's nature, a golden retriever's nature, to understand what is a good life for a golden retriever. Aristotle thinks that we can ask this exact same question in the exact same way when it comes to human beings. If we wanna know what a good life for a human being is, we have to ask ourselves, what kind of thing is a human being? And Aristotle's answer to that question is that human beings are rational animals. Now, both these two words are very important to Aristotle's conception of human nature. We are animals, we are embodied creatures with certain kinds of biological needs. Um, and, and goals and aims, but we're also rational animals. We 
we aren't just like non-human animals. There's distinctive features of us. And so for asking what is a good life for a human being, it's got to be something that captures both these aspects of us, the fact that we're animals and also the fact that we're rational. Now, Aristotle throws out this question, what is a good life for a human being? But he also has an answer for that question, an answer to it. And his answer has two parts. Aristotle claims that a good life, a flourishing life for a human being um, includes virtue and something that he calls external goods. External goods are things like good health, um, family and friends, enough money to live on, um, the absence of a pandemic, all of those things would be external goods for Aristotle. So in order to flourish as a human being, you need both these things, virtue and external goods. Now, crucially, although we tend to think about individuals as flourishing, for Aristotle, that's not the entire picture. And that's because for Aristotle, we're not just rational animals. Our nature is such that we are actually rational social animals, or as he puts it, we are political animals by nature. This means that we live together in groups. And because of that, we can't really think about our own flourishing except in the context of the flourishing of a broader community. So for Aristotle, flourishing is not just about me, it's about my broader community and the group of people with whom I create and share a life. Now, in the next slides, we're gonna be focusing in particularly on Aristotle's conception of virtue. What does Aristotle mean by a virtue? Well, here the Greek word in question is arete, and arete means excellence. Aristotle thinks that we can talk about excellence across a variety of different sorts of objects. So just think about the, like your, the favorite knife in your kitchen. Um, a good knife is sharp, it cuts well, it's well balanced, it does the job that you want it to do. And so the arte of that knife would be those things, the excellences that make the knife good at being the kind of thing that it is. Aristotle thinks that this is just what a virtue is. It's a trait or a characteristic that makes the thing good at being the kind of thing that it is. So back to dogs. If we think about what is an excellence in a retriever, it would be things like excellence at retrieving. My own golden retriever has not gotten this message. She's very bad at bringing things back. But in general, a good retriever will excel at this particular task, at retrieving things and bringing them back. Now, what about human beings? Um, we're rational animals. So maybe not surprisingly, Aristotle thinks that virtue in us is a kind of excellence at reasoning. Now, this may seem a little strange because it may seem like Aristotle thinks that to be a good human being is to be like good at calculus or Sudoku or something. And that's actually not entirely false because Aristotle does think that those are rational excellences. But there's a particular kind of rational excellence that's tied to living well and flourishing that is tied also to this concept of good judgment. And that's what we're going to look at. Aristotle divides up virtue into two different categories. There's a category of the moral virtues, they're sometimes called virtues of character, and the intellectual virtues, which are sometimes called virtues of thought. This distinction is actually quite important to Aristotle's account of good judgment. So I'm going to spend a little time explaining it. The moral virtues are the kinds of traits that you probably already think about as virtues, things like courage or generosity or temperance or compassion. There's an asterisk there because actually compassion isn't on Aristotle's list of virtues, but it's almost certainly on yours and mine um, as something that's valuable in a human being. Now, these are virtues, but they're virtues of a particular kind. And that is going to be important to understanding Aristotle's conception of good judgment, because these virtues don't operate alone. Instead, they have to operate in conjunction with something called an intellectual virtue. There are, for Aristotle, a bunch of different intellectual virtues, but the one that we're going to focus on is one called practical wisdom, or the Greek word is phronesis. Now, what is practical wisdom? Well, very sort of generally, it's excellent reasoning about what to do. And I'm gonna come back to this in significantly more detail shortly. But this is really important because Aristotle thinks that in order to really exemplify those moral virtues like courage and generosity and temperance and compassion, you need to be a good reasoner. Um, because if you're not, you're not gonna be able to translate those virtues into action. And this is the key for Aristotle's conception of virtue as a form of good judgment. Now, how do we get these virtues? 
The moral virtues we acquire through a process of habituation. Many people are familiar with this aspect of Aristotle's thought, this idea that you become virtuous by inculcating or having inculcated in yourself certain kinds of habits. And this definitely is part of Aristotle's thought, the idea that we develop moral virtues like courage and generosity through habituation that starts in childhood. So parents, teachers, other members of our society encourage us to do certain kinds of actions over and over again until they become part of our character. Very often people focus on this aspect of Aristotle as if it's the whole of Aristotle's conception of virtue, but it's not. And understanding this is important to understanding how judgment works for Aristotle. And that's because practical wisdom is not acquired through habituation. Aristotle thinks that practical wisdom is something that can't be taught. Instead, it's something that you can only acquire through a process of life experience. Aristotle thinks that practical wisdom is something that you figure out as you go along. Um, and it's because of that, it's not something that you have when you're very young. When I asked you about the person from whom you would seek advice, there's a good chance that the person that you chose is someone who has a lot of experience in the area that interests you, perhaps more experience than you, someone who you think has learned things along the way. And practical wisdom is capturing that aspect of how we ordinarily think about virtue and good judgment. So, Crucially for Aristotle, in order to be a virtuous person, you actually need both these things. You need the moral virtues and you need practical wisdom. And these things work together to make the virtuous person good at judging. This is what good judgment consists in for Aristotle. It is a combination of the moral virtues and the intellectual virtue of practical wisdom. And now we're going to jump into a bit more detail about what that means. Okay. So, Think about someone trying to figure out how to respond in a frightening situation. So I'm going to use courage as an example of a virtue here because it's familiar to many people and Aristotle uses it um, himself. If you think about someone trying to decide how to respond to a variety of frightening things, here are three, a bee, a grizzly bear, and COVID-19. Now, each of these things, um, it does inspire fear in people, not to the same degree and perhaps not to the right degree. And if you think about a person is trying to judge what she should do in response to any of these three things, should she find it, um, this is the kind of situation in which Aristotle thinks that good judgment is required. When we face frightening things, obviously, we are afraid. We have feelings of fear. And we have to figure out how to respond in light of those feelings of fear, as well as figure out whether those feelings of fear make sense. So in the case of a bee, then the feelings of fear are generally speaking not really appropriate because bees are largely harmless. Unless of course you're allergic to bees, in which case they're not harm harmless. So how the person should respond to a bee will depend on facts about what the bee is like, not a big threat, and also facts about her, well, a big threat to me if I'm allergic to bees. Now, in the case of a grizzly bear, this seems like something that should warrant more fear than a bee because grizzly bears are obviously capable of doing more harm to us than bees. Um, but not so much harm that we should be um, you know, afraid to a degree that would make us unable to cope with the grizzly bear. But a grizzly is something that does appropriately warrant fear in us and a different kind of response than a bee. Now, COVID-19 is obviously much more complex than either of those things, in part because we're still learning exactly the kind of harm or the kind of threat that COVID-19 poses. And we also recognize a couple of things. One, that the extent to which you should face up to COVID-19 depends on facts about, say, your job or the other kinds of responsibilities that you have, and also about its individual risks to you. So in each of these cases, we have something that someone would face as a threat, and the person has to decide how to respond to that threat. And good judgment for Aristotle and sort of intuitively is responding to those threats appropriately. And by that, I mean in a way that is responsive to the kind of threat that is actually posed as opposed to like our own um, you know, concerns or paranoias about things, and also is responsive to our own capacities to respond properly. Okay, so you may have heard, if you've read some Aristotle or studied some, of Aristotle's doctrine of the mean. This gets a lot of press in Aristotle, and understandably so, but it's actually a fairly, it's sometimes misunderstood. So we're going to spend a bit of time thinking about what it actually means. Aristotle says that virtue is the mean between two extremes of vice, and the vices, um, one represents an excess and one represents a 
deficiency. Now, when he says it's the mean, he doesn't mean that it's an arithmetic mean. So this is really important. It's not like virtue is always exactly in the middle of these two things. Virtue actually moves around a bit. But let's take, again, the example of courage to get a sense of what Aristotle's after. So courage is, of course, a virtue. Um, how does it occupy a mean between extremes of excess and deficiency? Well, let's think about cowardice. We might understand cowardice as an excess of fear. So the person who is cowardly fears too much, or maybe they fear the wrong things. Um, there's different ways in which cowardice could be understood as an excess. There's also such a thing as a deficiency of fear, and this is what Aristotle calls rashness. To be rash is to be insufficiently afraid. So the person who is not afraid of the grizzly is probably being rash um, in that respect. Courage is about making an assessment, and that assessment um, encompasses, as we'll see, both sort of affective dimensions, our emotions, and also our reason. But the person who is courageous, what is distinctive about them, the person who has the virtue, is that they can judge correctly what to do in the circumstance, and they can also, of course, act on that judgment. This is what is, for Aristotle, constitutive of being a virtuous person. And this is the way in which the virtuous person is the mean between these two extremes. The people on the extremes, the coward and the rash person, aren't able to judge correctly what they should do, or they're not able to act on that judgment. But the virtuous person is capable of doing both those things. We're gonna be focusing a little bit more on the capacity to judge correctly, but the acting on that judgment is of course very important to being virtuous as well. Okay. Now, what does the capacity for good judgment require? Going back to that distinction between moral and intellectual virtues, it needs both. So for the moral virtues, what the capacity for good judgment requires is what I'm going to call here, and I'll explain in a minute, appropriate affective orientations. But it's not just that. The moral virtues also require this addition of practical wisdom, which is this capacity for judgment. And practical wisdom has two components that we're going to focus on, knowledge about what is good and bad for human beings and the ability to put that knowledge into practice in particular situations. So in order to have good judgment, in order to be virtuous, you're going to need both these things, both the moral virtues and practical wisdom contribute to that capacity to judge correctly in the situation. So now I'm going to say a bit more about what each of these two capacities involves. Sorry, should have said, these two things are also, as we're going to see, interrelated in important ways. Aristotle thinks that you can't actually have one of these without the others. In order to have the moral virtues, a virtue like courage, you also need to have practical wisdom. And in order to have practical wisdom, you also need to have the virtues like courage and generosity. So that we will come back to. Okay, moral virtues. Imagine for a minute um, that you're outside a burning building and you're trying to decide whether to go into it and save things. Now, is this a good idea? Well, um, probably not. You should just call 911. But let's imagine that that's not an option and you have to decide whether to run in. Obviously, the answer to that question depends on what is in the house or who is in the house. If there are people in the house that need saving, that gives you a reason to run in. If it's just a matter of like, you know, pulling out of somebody's LP collection from the 60s or 70s, maybe not so much. Because of course, when you run into a building, you're a burning building, you're risking your life. And there are some things that are worth risking your life for and some things that are not. This is pretty intuitive. But the capacity for courage on Aristotle's view requires making a good judgment about what things are worth risking your life for. In order to do that, though, Aristotle thinks our ability to make that assessment, is this worth running into a burning building for, depends on what I called on the previous slide, our affective orientations. Or here's another way of putting it. What kinds of things do people value? And how does what you value affect what you think and do? So a person who is courageous values their own life, but they also value the lives of other people. And the fact that they value the lives of other people means that they will consider the fact that there are people in that building as a reason to run in there and risk their own life to save them. And so the way in which they think about other people and their valuing of other people is going to affect their judgment about what to do. Someone who doesn't value the life of other people or who maybe values their own life too much or too little is going to make a different judgment. Think about this in the context of a different virtue, the virtue of generosity. The person 
a person who is generous right, um, is attentive to the fact that other people need things. Right? They're, they're, they value the well-being of other people and they value their own property somewhat less than that in the sense that they're willing to give up things from themselves in order to be able to help other people. And so they're, they're valuing the way in which we all value or don't value our own property, our own money affects our capacity to act generously. In somewhat more technical terms, we might say that what the moral virtues do and the contribution that they make to good judgment on Aristotle's view is they shape our attachments to things. The moral virtues that we're trained in since childhood and that we're habituated into teach us and orient us toward caring about certain things rather than others. And those attachments then in turn shape our judgments. It's because we care about the suffering of other people that we're inclined to be generous, that we see that as a reason to give from our own supplies or our own bank accounts in order to help them. So our attachments, the things that we care about, the things that we value affect our judgments. And this is why Aristotle thinks the moral virtues are so important to our capacity for good judgment, because what they do is enable us or help us see the world in a certain way, as certain things as being important and other things as not being important and being attached to those things in a way that leads us to want to preserve them or protect them or promote them in some way. Now, what happens with the moral virtues? So the moral virtues are something that we have to cultivate and do so over time. It may be the case um, that we end up attached to the wrong things if our childhood went awry um, and we became attached to things that we shouldn't be attached to at all. Or this is probably more common, we're attached to the right things, but we're attached to them in the wrong way. It might be that we're attached to them too much um, or that we're attached to them across too many different spheres of action. And then finally, we could be attached to the right kinds of things and also in the right way. So attachment to the wrong things, Aristotle things, will lead to bad judgment. If Here's a really obvious case if people are excessively attached, for instance, um, to, their own, um, to their own image, they're going to be judging badly about the significance of maintaining their own reputation at the cost of other things. Um, or we could be attached to the right things, but in the wrong way. So this for Aristotle is still bad, but maybe less bad than the other kind of judgment. So imagine here a case of someone who is attached to their children. Okay, it's good to be attached to your children, that's important, but you shouldn't be so attached to your children um, that you act badly in other respects, that you value their well-being over anybody else's well-being, or that you're you know, tempted to you know, cheat on their behalf or other kinds of things. So it's possibly to be attached to things that are worth being attached to, but not do it very well. And then finally, attachment to the right things in the right way for Aristotle is what produces good judgment. So with the moral virtues that we acquire in childhood that we're habituated into, well, their contribution to good judgment is the way in which they shape our attachments and they enable us to sort of like see the situation that we're facing in the right way. They make certain things salient and other things less important in the moment. Okay, now let's turn to practical wisdom. So practical wisdom, this is how Aristotle defines it. Um, it's not the world's most helpful definition, but it's a place to start. A state grasping the truth involving reason concerned with actions that are good or bad for a human being. So a couple of things about this definition. One, Aristotle mentions truth. This is very important. The practically wise person is an excellent reasoner and they're an excellent reasoner in part because they are good at grasping the truth. Aristotle thinks there is a truth about what is good or bad for us. There is a truth about what makes us flourish and what doesn't. And that is something, the kind of thing that the practically wise person knows. In fact, that's largely what their wisdom consists in. They understand the truth about what is good and bad for human beings. Aristotle distinguishes practical wisdom, the virtue, from something that sometimes looks like practical wisdom, but he thinks is not, which he calls cleverness. The person who is clever is very good at means and reasoning. We all know people like this. It can be very useful to know people who are clever. They're good at helping you attain their ends. Um, but people who are clever can also be really bad people uh, because knowing the means to your ends doesn't necessarily mean that the ends are good ones. In order to be practically wise, Aristotle thinks, you need to know how to achieve the means to your ends, but you also have to know what those ends are worth, which ends are worth pursuing. And this is the part that the merely clever person doesn't know. So the practically wise person is clever, they're good at means and reasoning, but they also know which ends are worth pursuing and promoting. And that's why it makes it a virtue. They grasp the truth about the ends that are, that are important to achieving flourishing. 
Practical wisdom as we might say, two different components to it. One, this knowledge of what is actually good or bad for human beings, or what I'm gonna call knowledge of what is worthwhile. Now there's two different aspects of this that I wanna highlight because I think it's worth seeing that there's, there's sort of two ways in which this knowledge shows up. There's knowledge about what's worthwhile in general, and there's also an ability to see that knowledge or have that knowledge be functional for you in the moment. So there's lots of people, for instance, who are like, yes, I really value my family or my friends in general, and they're not wrong. Those things are really worthwhile. But sometimes in the moment, they're not very good at seeing that this particular course of action is actually important to their friendship or their family relationships. So there's sort of general knowledge, and then there's the ability to bring that knowledge to bear on the particular situation. That's very important. The second part of practical wisdom is the ability to put that knowledge into concrete action. We've all had the experience of knowing um, that something should happen, but not actually being able to put it into practice. Like maybe you're in a really awkward social interaction and you're like, ah, I need to do something here, but you don't know what to do. For Aristotle, practical wisdom involves both these components. You know what should be done and you also know how to do the thing. So let me give you a couple of examples to illustrate this. One that's really straightforward, CPR. Um, it's very often apparent to people, but not always when CPR is required. It's apparent if you're a medical professional, but for lay people, maybe not. Um, so you might know it's really good to save this person to save lives. And you might also be able to recognize that the person in front of you is suffering from cardiac arrest. But um, and even if you know CPR, at least in theory, in order to save the person's life, you obviously have to be able to put that knowledge into action. You have to be the person who can be like, OK, I'm going to start doing chest compressions right now. That is crucial. And for Aristotle, the practically wise person is not just a person who knows things. They're also a person who does things. Practical wisdom is putting knowledge into action. So that capacity for judgment is not just about being like, that's the right thing to do. It's also about being able to do that thing, to act on that. A somewhat more complicated example, think about political arguments. Um, many of us have a vague idea that it's worthwhile for people to get along and democracy to flourish and so forth, and we think that's right, but it's a very difficult thing to put into concrete action when you're faced with someone who has different political views than you um, on Facebook or in a real life conversation, um, people with different ideas about vaccination. We're familiar with these particular situations. The practically wise person, Aristotle thinks, knows what to do in these circumstances. They know how to behave in ways that will enact that knowledge, that will put that understanding of what is worthwhile into practice. So back to Aristotle's doctrine of the mean for a minute. Virtue, remember, is that capacity to judge what should be done and to act on the basis of that knowledge. Now we can make it a little bit more specific. So the moral virtues contribution is that the virtuous person is attached to the right things in the right way. Their emotions are sort of attuned to the things that really matter in those situations. They care about those things. And that is what's gonna help motivate them to act, but also enable them to see the kinds of things that are at stake. Um, so imagine someone who is capable, who's motivated to make sure that no one in a social gathering is, say, for instance, really embarrassed. But it also means that they're able to look at the situation and see who is embarrassed. There's knowledge of what is worthwhile. And this is one of the parts that practical wisdom that um, that practical wisdom contributes to this. And then there's the ability to translate that knowledge into action. So the first one is the moral virtues, and the second two are practical wisdom. One of the metaphors that Aristotle often uses is that of archery, a target. Aristotle thinks that the virtuous person is capable of hitting a target appropriately. And as he points out, there's a lot of ways to go wrong and only one way to get it right. It's a whole lot easier to get things wrong than to get things right. The virtuous person is able to nail it. They're able to get the center of the target. Okay. This is why people often think about virtue as a skill. Aristotle talks about um, other examples of skills or crafts like woodworking or carpentry or playing musical instruments. Um, the idea that we can to master a skill is to be able to, to uh, sort of master a whole complex set of things that involve not just your reason, but also your emotions and your senses and a whole bunch of different things. In clinical judgment in many ways, thinking about this in a healthcare setting is very similar to this. The idea that there is a skill attached to virtue and to making good judgments and acting well in a clinical setting. The idea that practical wisdom is this complex capacity is one of the reasons for thinking that it makes sense to talk about this as a skill. And it has to be remember something that you learn and accomplish over time.
And this is why for Aristotle, moral expertise is really a form of practical expertise. It is a way of seeing the world and knowing things that matter, but it's also a matter of being able to do things because you can know all kinds of things about a violin and how to play it without actually being able to play it. And likewise, you can know all kinds of things about how best to practice medicine without actually being able to practice it well. So moral expertise and practical expertise for Aristotle go together. Okay, summary. A virtuous person has moral virtues and they have practical wisdom and that makes them a fully virtuous person. They judge well and they act well. And for Aristotle, this means that they are an excellent human being. Let's put this very briefly into context. In a clinical context, good judgment, as everyone knows, is very, very difficult to come by. And even outside of that, if we think just sort of generally about public health in the context of the pandemic, the kinds of decisions that people have to make at the CDC or the WHO, or that people are making in the context of hospitals or nursing home administrators, all these incredibly difficult decisions that people have had to be making over the past 16, 14, 16 months or so. If we put this in Aristotelian terms, what good judgment in these contexts requires are three things. You need to be attached to the right things in the right way, to care about the right kinds of things. You need to know what is worthwhile, what is really worth preserving and doing in human life, what kinds of things matter. And you need that skill, the ability to translate that knowledge into action in a way that will do the most good and help people come through the pandemic as best they can. Aristotle says this is difficult. Very few people can actually pull this off. But the people who can pull it off are people that's well worth modeling and emulating and learning from. Thank you very much. I look forward to talking with you during the, um, this week and answering any questions that you might have.